بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. إن شاء الله continuing with our study of the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى تفسير القرآن. We have been covering Surah Al-Baqarah. We started with the beginning of the uh, Mus'haf. We started with Surah Al-Fatiha and then proceeded into Surah Al-Baqarah. In our previous session, we concluded with ayah number 26. And so very briefly, I'm going to go through ayah number 26 and its translation because ayah number 27 uh, through ayah number 29, which inshallah what we hope to cover today, uh, builds upon what was covered in ayah number 26. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in ayah number 26 says, Inna Allah la yistahyi an yadriba mathalam ma ba'udatan fama fawqaha. That most definitely Allah is not weary. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not mind to give an example of be it a mosquito or a gnat or anything beyond that. فَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا فَيَعْلَمُونَ أَنَّهُ الْحَقُّ مِنْ رَبِّهِمْ As for those who believe, then they know that this is the truth from their Lord and Master Allah. وَأَمَّا الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا فَيَقُولُونَ مَاذَا أَرَادَ اللَّهُ بِهَذَا مَثَلًا And as for those who disbelieve, then they say that what did God intend by giving this example? Meaning that they are skeptical. And then they cast aspersions upon these examples given within the Qur'an. يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا That Allah referring to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He misguides many by, by way of this, by means of this, وَيَهْدِي بِهِ كَثِيرًا And He guides many by way of this. وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ إِلَّا الْفَاسِقِينَ And He only misguides by way of this those who are sinful or those who are disobedient to Allah. So that was ayah number 26, and this was based off of the fact that in before ayah number 26, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave two very powerful, gripping examples of the hypocrites. Those who disbelieve, but they feign Islam, and they try to deceive the Muslims, and they try to create uh, chaos within the Muslim community, and so discord amongst the Muslims. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave two very powerful, very elaborate examples talking about what their reality is. And there are many uh, narrations which talk about the fact that some of the disbelievers and some of the hypocrites, when they heard these examples in the Qur'an, they lashed out and they said, what kind of God talks about these kinds of things and gives all these random examples and so on and so forth. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is responding to them here saying that this further highlights your lack of intelligence. Your lack of faith was something that was already confirmed, something we already knew about. Now what you're confirming for us is your lack of intelligence. And as we talked about previously, because the point of an example is not exactly, it, it does not matter what you are using as the example. The real purpose of an example is the meaning that it communicates. So a lot of times when we're talking about human behavior and we're trying to illustrate people's behavior, we might give the example of a child. Now the focus is not the child. We might give the example of an animal. And we find this very commonly. Right, that it'll liken certain human behavior to different types of animal. Now, if some certain types of animals. Now, if somebody tries to say, "Oh, you're giving examples of animals, and how how does that reflect your character?" No, how does that reflect your intelligence, where you didn't understand the purpose behind the example? All right. So that's Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gives that response, and how these examples within the Quran. Some people read these examples and find profound levels of enlightenment. 
profound levels of enlightenment. It, it opens their minds, it opens their hearts, and they're able to understand so much more through these examples. Yahdi bihi kathiran. That is God guiding them. Some people read these same examples within the Qur'an and these same verses, and all they can fixate on is trying to find some kind of fault or problem with it. And what that does, that illustrates the fact that they completely missed the point and, found, and became further misguided. So they read the Qur'an and then somehow end up further misguided. And that's truly, truly an unfortunate state and reality. Now continuing on with ayah number 27, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talking about this. Because at the end of ayah number 26, Allah said, The only people who are misguided through this are those who are disobedient to God. Those people who are wretched, those people who are sinful, those people who blatantly disregard any kind of command from Allah. They find themselves completely misguided and Allah misguides them, lets them go. Uh, misguided. Now, in ayah number 27, Allah further elaborates al-fasiqeen. These people who end up so misguided, these sinful, disobedient, wretched people, there are certain qualities, traits, and characteristics that lead them to the point of being so disobedient and far outside the grace of God, that they find themselves completely misguided. There are certain characteristics. Listen, this is not something where somebody was completely fine today and they were basking in the glow of the divine light and the divine guidance today and then they wake up tomorrow and they're completely misguided. It's not that kind of thing. There was a trajectory, there was a course, there was a path that led them to that particular point. There are certain traits and characteristics that they had that they completely ignored, that they did not pay attention to, that eventually took them to the point of this absolute misguidance. Now what are some of those traits and characteristics? Let's take a look at it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us here starting in ayah number 27. <laughs> So as always, after reading the ayah, I'll share what a translator has written for the ayah and then we'll talk about it in more detail. The translator writes, those who break their covenant with God after it has been confirmed, who sever the bonds that God has commanded to be joined, who spread corruption on the earth, these are the losers. So now let's talk about it in a little bit more detail what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us, what Allah is implying here within this particular verse. The first characteristic, bad quality, bad trait, the problem with these people that Allah mentions is الَّذِينَ يَنْقُضُونَ عَهْدَ اللَّهِ مِنْ بَعْدِ مِيثَاقِهِ They are those people who break, they violate, they... Um, destroy the covenant that they had with God after its confirmation, after it was confirmed. So they had a covenant with God, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reiterated and confirmed multiple times over, and they completely disregarded it, and they totally violated it. That was their first problem. That was their very first issue. So now what is this covenant that we have with Allah? What is this covenant with God that is being referred to here? So there's a number of different things that we can talk about here. The first and foremost, the most obvious, the most significant of them is what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about in the Qur'an, in surah number 7, ayah number 172, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this. وَإِذْ أَخَذَ رَبُّكَ مِن بَنِي آدَمَ مِن ذُهُرِهِمْ ذُرِّيَّتَهُمْ وَأَشْهَدَهُمْ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ أَلَسْتُ بِرَبِّكُمْ قَالُوا بَلَىٰ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about this, that when He brought together all the souls of the children of Adam, all human beings that would ever exist and be born into this world, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gathered the souls of all these human beings and asked them a question and 
basically Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded this entire moment in conversation. Ashhadakum ala anfusin. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala recorded this. And what did Allah ask them? Allah asked them, Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Am I not your Lord? And so in the Arabic language, there's something very interesting. In the Arabic language, when you combine an nafi wal istifham, an nafi wal istifham, right? So it's kind of like the, the way to emphasize a question, obviously the question is, am I your Lord? But here it's being said, am I not your Lord? This is in the Arabic language, in classical Arabic, this is how you emphasize a question. That instead of just asking us the normal question, am I your Lord? Am I not your Lord? And so what it, the, way, the best way to translate it into English is that am I your Lord or not? That's kind of how we create that same kind of emphasis in the English language. Alastu bi rabbikum. Am I not your Lord? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, qalu, they all responded in unison, bala. Of course, you are our Lord. So that, that is the covenant that we have with Allah. Allah created us, Allah granted us our existence. Every single thing that we have is given to us, provided to us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so what we owe to Allah is, first and foremost, the recognition of His divinity. Him as a deity, as a God. And recognizing His oneness as God. Secondly, we also then owe Him our obedience to the best of our ability. We owe Him our obedience, our veneration, our devotion, our dedication. And so this is what's owed to us by Allah. There is this covenant that is in place. Furthermore, it's also talked about other places in the Qur'an as well, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about that there's also a covenant in place about accepting the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as a prophet and a messenger. Surah Al-Baqarah is a Madani surah. We talked about this. It's a Madinan surah, which means that it was revealed in a Madinan period after the hijrah, the migration to Medina. After the hijrah and the migration to Medina, this Qur'anic revelation is not only addressing, it of course addresses all humanity, but it not only touches on the issue of the people of Mecca who worshipped idols, the pagans who worshipped many, many gods, right? But it also addressed the issue of the Ahlul Kitab, the Christians and the Jews, those who believed in scriptures and prophets before the Qur'an and before the Prophet Muhammad And so it also highlighted this issue that وَإِذْ أَخَذْنَا مِيثَاقَ النَّبِيِّنَ لَمَا أَتَيْتَكُمْ مِنْ كِتَابٍ وَحِكْمَةٍ ثُمَّ جَاءَكُمْ رَسُولٌ مُصَدِّقٌ لِمَا مَعَكُمْ لَتُؤْمِنُنَّ بِهِ وَلَا تَنْصُرُنَّهُ This is a verse of the Qur'an which lays out the issue that all the prophets that came before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, they were a covenant, a promise, an oath was taken from them. You know, a lot of times when you assume some kind of a position, it comes with the taking of an oath. You give an oath about what your responsibilities are, what you will abide by, how you will conduct yourself. Every single prophet and messenger that came before the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the Qur'an says they had to take an oath. And one of the things that they had to take an oath about was that while you are still alive as a prophet and a messenger of God, and a subsequent messenger comes while you're still alive, a following messenger, a subsequent messenger comes who is confirming everything that you have. It is truly a messenger from God. Then it is your duty, it is your obligation, it is your responsibility, and a part of your covenant, your oath as a prophet and a messenger, that you will believe in the prophethood and the mission of that prophet, and you will fall in line and assist that prophet. Because that prophet has come after you, so that prophet is now an update to God's message. He is the latest update from God. 
So you will actually fall in line behind that prophet. And so if we take that now, and you basically play out the logic of that, what that basically means is, all the scripture that came before the Qur'an, once the Qur'an comes, all that scripture now becomes supplemental to the Qur'an. All the prophets and messengers that came throughout time, of course, they are respected and revered. But once the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ came, now they all fall in line behind the Prophet ﷺ. And we, of course, know about the illustration and the demonstration of this on exactly the night of Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. When the Prophet ﷺ traveled by night from Mecca to Jerusalem to Masjid Aqsa, Baytul Maqdis, where the Prophet ﷺ led all the prophets and messengers sent throughout time, he led them in prayer that night. And so this was also a part of the covenant. So this is also addressing the people of the book, the people who say we believe in God and we believe in angels and we believe in scripture and we believe in prophets and messengers and revelation. Well, if you believe in all those things, then how can more revelation come from God, another messenger be sent by God and you completely neglect him and in fact, furthermore, you refute him, you oppose him. How does that make any sense? So this is the covenant that was in place. And this was the covenant that was ignored by them and rejected by them and not paid attention to. So that is the very first quality, negative trait that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, emphasizes here and that He mentions and that is that God gave you responsibility. You, have a, you had a covenant and a promise, an oath that you took with God that Allah emphasized, He recorded and He mentioned it to you. You are very well aware of this. And then you broke it, you violated it. They violate the oath of God, the covenant, the promise they have with Allah after it's been emphasized, recorded and documented. Number two, the second trait and characteristic of disbelieving people people who find themselves completely misguided, how do they get so far off the rails? How do they end up so misguided? The first quality we talked about, they disregard their relationship with Allah, their covenant with Allah. And then number two, what is number two? They break, they cut, they break or cut, that which God commanded them to join. So this seems a little bit, you know, open-ended, and we'll, we'll further kind of, you know, detail this. But I first want everyone to just understand and appreciate the language that Allah is using. They break that which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded to be joined. Something was told, they were commanded, they were told to keep something together and then they broke it apart. They cut it. Now what are exactly those things? What exactly are those things? So there's a few different things here. And the best, one very good way to kind of organize that together, some of the scholars have explained it and laid it out very well, and it's not very complicated, but it's just a very good way to organize a conversation, that there are two types of things that we have been told to maintain. We have been told to upkeep, to keep up with, to maintain. They are huququllah and huququl ibad. All right, or huququl khalq. Huququllah basically means the rights of God. So there are some things that we've been told to keep up from our end, maintain from our end, take care of from our end, in regards to our relationship with Allah. Our relationship with Allah. So it is, whether it be our faith, our belief, our iman, or it be other things um, such as our obligations in terms of worship, devotion, dedication, 
what's called fara'id, the obligations from Allah. We've been told to keep up with these things, maintain these things. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also tells us repeatedly in the Quran, He outlines certain major sins. Major sins, major crimes, major acts of indiscretion. وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught, لَا يَدْعُونَ مَعَ اللَّهِ إِلَهًا آخَرًا وَلَا يَقْتُلُونَ النَّفْسَ الَّتِي حَرَّمَ اللَّهُ إِلَا بِالْحَقِّ وَلَا يَزْنُونَ Many things, a few things like that. Not many things, or a few things like that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Do not call on any partners aside from God. Don't worship anything other than Allah. Don't take an innocent life. Do not commit adultery or fornication. So do not steal. Don't take anything that is not your property. Don't slander. So on and so forth. So these are, there are certain major acts of indiscretion that Allah has outlined in the Quran. And after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about many of them, He oftentimes says, وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the boundaries set down by God. وَمَنْ يَتَعَدَّ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَقَدْ ظَلَمَ نَفْسَهُ Anyone who crosses these lines and boundaries, then that person is damning themselves. They are dooming their soul. Do not do that. We were just in um, the tafsir class uh, at the seminary with the students. We were going through the verses of the distribution of inheritance. Again, taking something that does not belong to you. So an individual dies, let's say that a man dies, and he leaves behind his wife and children. There are portions allocated to each person in that relationship. Now if one person usurps other people's portions and takes it for himself, then now he's taking something that does not belong to him. And at the conclusion of laying out the basic framework about how wealth is distributed in the event of someone's passing, what does Allah say there? وَتِلْكَ حُدُودُ اللَّهِ These are the boundaries set down by Allah. Do not cross these lines. So the حُقُقُ refers to the fact that Allah has certain rights upon us. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His graciousness, and His mercy, and His compassion, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's obligations upon us are so minimal. I know we struggle with them, so they seem like they're very heavy, like they're a lot. But they only seem heavy, they only seem like they're a lot because of our own nafs. We're so spoiled, rotten. Or because of shaitan, the dissuasion and persuasion of shaitan, the evil forces around us. Because of the weakness of our own souls, it feels like it's a lot. Otherwise, if you actually sat down and do some math, we love doing math, right? We love counting our money. We love doing math. So if we sat down and did a little bit of math, we'd come to the realization that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's obligations upon us, Allah, are so minimal. Very minimal. We have to pray five times a day. One of the things people profoundly struggle with. But if you were really to break it down, there are fara'id. There's the obligatory, mandatory parts of the prayer. And I'm not, I'm not disregarding the sunnah prayers. So I don't want anyone to interpret this as disrespect towards the sunnah prayers. No, no, no. But I'm, let's take it one step at a time. Let's talk about the bare, bare minimum. Absolute obligation. Two rakahs for fajr. How long does that take? Right? A couple of minutes on average. Again, I'm not saying that we should not take longer or take more time. But again, we're talking about bare minimum. Creating a minimal threshold. Dhuhr, four rakahs. Asr, four rakahs. Four rakahs. Maghrib, three. Isha, four. I know some Hanafi folks will be offended by the witr thing, but a bare minimum threshold. Two, four, four, three, and four. And if 
it's on average about a minute per rak'ah that the average common basic person would take. 15, 20? All right, let's kind of build it out a little bit. Let's start kind of adding a little bit of quality. 25 minutes in a day? 30 minutes in a day? Out of 24 hours, we owe God 30 minutes. The amount of time it takes to watch a sitcom. Right? So, minimal. Fasting in Ramadan, that's a big deal. That's one month out of 12. One month out of 12. Zakat, two and a half percent of your savings. Not your wealth, not what you're worth. Your house is excluded, your cars are excluded, your appliances are excluded, your clothes are excluded. Everything's excluded. It's your savings. Money that you've been sitting on for a whole year, two and a half percent of that money. And that too, there's difference of opinion. Maybe you can deduct your debts. Minimal. Hajj, big deal. I take time off from work. It's very expensive these days, brother. Once in your entire lifetime. Once in your entire lifetime. Twelve days once in your life. That's it. And that's it. Those are hukukullah. And then there's about five, six things. Don't do those five, six things. Don't steal. Shouldn't be too difficult. Right? And I know there's, temp there's the element of temptation, but still. Fornication, adultery. Worshipping something other than God. Don't murder somebody else. Wasn't supposed to be that difficult. Right? And that's it. Hukukullah. Very minimal. But that's what Allah is saying. الَّذِينَ يَقْتَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ وَيَقْتَعُونَ مَا أَمَرَ اللَّهُ بِهِ أَنْ يُوصَلُ But these minimal things that we owe to God, they just couldn't hold it together. They ended up violating these very, very handful, you can count them on two hands, minimal things. Then the second realm of it is حقوق العباد حقوق الخلق حقوق الناس You can call it either way, it just means the rights of the people. The rights of the creation of God. The rights of the slaves of God. So the rights of the people. And there's, once again, the rights of the people, again, that sounds very heavy. And we've been told to be very mindful of it, and that's a good thing. But a lot of times it weighs on us like it's very, very heavy. It's impossible to maintain and keep. But really it's not. Again, let's just take a very, very minimalistic, minimal look at it. At the end of the day, the vast overwhelming majority, the, the very dominant majority of human beings on this earth, I don't have a relationship with them and I'm not obligated to have a relationship with them. I can live a very kind of quiet, minimal life where I don't interact with most people and I don't owe them anything and they don't owe me anything. But there's a very small circle of people that there are responsibilities and obligations. First and foremost, obviously, is one's family. And even in a family, there's kind of a gradients. وَأُلُوا الْأَرْحَامِ بَعْضُهُمْ أَوْلَى بِبَعْضٍ Some people have more rights than other people do. Right? So, if you're desi, right? Your mother's, uncle's, third cousin, right? You basically owe him everything, all right? Not really, not according to Sharia. If you want to have a relationship with them, mashallah, that's good for you, congratulations. I guess I'm happy for you. But that's, Sharia really doesn't care. Islam doesn't say you need to have a, like a relationship where you need to call that person and tell him about everything that happened in your day every single day. No, Islam doesn't require that of you. There's different levels of relationships. There are the people who are most immediately related to you. Your parents, grandparents, usul, what's called. There are the furur, your children, grandchildren. There's one spouse. Then there's what's called the hawashi, right? Your brothers and sisters, siblings, uncles and aunts, 
a little bit further out, and that's pretty much where it stops. Meaning, in terms of what Sharia mandates. Mandates. So these are called the Wil Arham. Silatul Rahim. We hear this terminology a lot. Maintaining family ties and family relationships. Right? The upkeep of family ties, family relationships. So, okay, that's something that you have to maintain. And again, maintain it with a level of reason, within reason. It doesn't mean that somebody, my uncle, or let alone forget my uncle, my brother, basically is demanding, you know, unlimited access to my wealth that I have to give it now, family relationships. No, absolutely not. I don't know that at all. It's just about maintaining decency, helping out where one can help out, maintaining good open communication, always being willing to say salam first, salam. always being willing to communicate and have a conversation and not doing any wrong. And so these are maintaining of the family relationships. And obviously there are some people that you owe more to. One's parents, you do owe a lot. Taking care of them, making sure that they're okay. One's children, providing the tarbiyah, the upbringing, the basic needs and necessities of one's children. One's spouse, there's a level of responsibility and obligation in terms of between spouses. Husband having to provide and take care of and providing proper living and so on and so forth, needs and necessities for his wife. Honor and respect, loyalty and faithfulness. A wife similarly owing that kind of loyalty and faithfulness, respect towards the husband and so on and so forth. So these are the responsibilities in terms of family dynamics, family relationships. And then beyond that, there's pretty much, in terms of hukuk al ibad rights towards other people, there are a couple of different things. First and foremost, it, next after that, secondly is, anyone that you conduct business with. If you have financial dealings with someone, then you owe them honesty. Laysa minna man khashana. Anyone who wrongs us, deceives us, cheats us, is not from amongst us. So being honest, transparent, Straightforward in financial dealings. Number three is the Prophet ﷺ talked about neighbors, the people that you live around. There is a level of responsibility. Meaning, and what is that level of responsibility? That your neighbor should not fear you doing any harm. You don't have to do a whole lot more, you just gotta make sure you don't harm your neighbors. And beyond that, that's about it. Again, it's very important. I'm not trying to downplay the importance. I am trying to create a more practical understanding of it. Because sometimes we hyperbolize it to the point where it becomes this like mountain that we can't climb. Oh, we can never live up to this standard. No, absolutely you can. You just have to decide that you want to. And then put work into it and understand the significance and the importance of it and how it impacts you in this dunya and it most definitely will impact you in the life of the hereafter. But when people stop caring about these things, hukukullah and hukukul ibad, they stop caring about their obligations, their ibadah, their worship, they don't pray, they don't fast, and then they stop caring about what they owe people and their personal relationships. Now what that does is that starts to erode your iman. And it starts to sully and soil your heart. It starts to poison your soul. And that will eventually now lead you to completely breaking your covenant with God, which will lead you to become blatantly sinful and disobedient and disrespectful to Allah, which ultimately leads you to being completely misguided. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is showing how someone gets there. So the second thing Allah talked about was, They break that which God told them to keep together. And then the third thing Allah says, And they wreak havoc. They cause chaos within the earth. 
They wreak havoc and cause chaos within the earth. And there's a few things here that are detailed out as well, which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about different places in the Quran. Number one, obviously, is if Sa'd fil Ard also refers to their disobedience and sinfulness. They start leading a sinful life, diso disregarding everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has told them about right and wrong, good and bad. Number two is if Sa'd fil Ard is also when they start to do wrong to other people, they start committing acts of oppression, violence is described as Fasad fil Ard. Ittiba'u shahawat. And they become completely enslaved to their desires. I'm just going to do what I want, when I want, how I want, where I want, to whomsoever I want. Just a complete beast and an animal. That when they start living their lives in this way, then that becomes very, very problematic. So this is ifsad fil ard. They cause chaos, wreak havoc within the earth. And this again, it started from where a person ends up and it's showing how they get there. A person starts living a life where they just want to do whatever they feel like doing. They don't care about right and wrong. Whatever feels good, whatever I feel like doing, I'm just going to do it without any regard for consequences. Where does that lead? That leads to a person not, like, not even caring about the basics, the minimal standard. God told me to pray five times a day, whatever. God told me to be good to my family, whatever. Then they start breaking everything that God told them to maintain. That further, as we talked about, ultimately leads them to just not even caring about what, who Allah is and what Allah has said anymore. And that leads them to becoming blatantly sinful and disrespectful, completely disregarding right and wrong, good and bad, which ultimately leads them to being totally misguided. And they find themselves completely outside of the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah protect us all. So this is showing you how, where a person starts out and tragically and unfortunately where they can end up. And so that's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala details for us here in ayah number 27. This is a very comprehensive verse that many of the scholars, the mufassirun, the usuliyun, the scholars of usul, that they have pointed to this particular verse, that this verse very powerfully and um, you know, very effectively, philosophically outlines right how a person with all their good and all their potential, how they can end up so absolutely corrupted. This kind of shows the different steps that happen there and how human corruption occurs over a period of time. And so that took a little bit longer than I expected. Such is the nature of the Quran, the Book of Allah. And I know that it's kind of a cold night. So inshallah, we'll go ahead and pause here because if I go into the next two verses, it'll go on way longer than both you and I bargained for. All right, so inshallah, I'll go ahead and pause here. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make the Quran the light of our lives. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala illuminate our hearts with the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala improve our character through the Qur'an. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to live by the Qur'an. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from the people of the Qur'an. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Subhanallahi wa bihamdihi. Subhanak Allahumma bihamdik. Nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka wa natubu ilayhi.